Hello everyone this is part 21 of what if Naruto was a puppeteer, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. was beginning to resemble the inside of a volcano, more than a secret arena in an underground bunker. Naruto had managed to sequester himself up in one of the shadowy corners of the room, replacing himself with a hanged dami at first opportunity, and he was still feeling the immense heat. It seemed to roll up from the rivers of molten rock below in sweltering, unbearable waves. But he had trained himself for this, okay, not precisely this, but similarly difficult situations, and didn't move a single muscle save for the subtle twitches of his fingers. It was all in how realistic he made Dami's movements look. He made the puppet stumble ever so slightly on more difficult leaps and dodges, keeping the hanged features expressive always. Likewise, when Inari went out of Dami's line of sight, she became just that little bit less dexterous. Never enough to put her in serious danger, but enough to be noticeable for a well-trained eye. If Kakazu ever tried to take advantage of it, and if he was smart, he would, then he would be in for a nasty surprise, because in this position Naruto had unparalleled sight over their impromptu battlefield. Of course, keeping up a convincing act wasn't his biggest problem. Yoten was not the rogue ninja's only surprise, as evidenced when the skinny masked creature zipping about the room like a particularly persistent insect let out a sudden stream of bright white lances of energy. Each of them crackled like a rate in technique, but moved like flexible beams of light, curving across the room in their attempt to divert Inari away from Kakazu. Ranton, Riza Sakasu, the man intoned blandly, eyes tracking the nimble puppet's progress as she sprinted around the walls of the room. The floor had become much too dangerous save for a small circle of untouched, hard-packed earth at Kakazu's feet. While Inari was trying to avoid those, his hanged facsimile was similarly on the move, racing away from what looked to be a miniature sun that chased him unerringly. Naruto had never heard of Scorch Release, but the techniques it produced were quite terrifying, and also the reason he was hiding up in the corner. Where that little ball of intense heat touched his puppet, not a lot seemed to happen. It mostly just charred the skin a little without doing any damage. On something alive on the other hand, it was extremely dangerous. One of those moving orbs of pure heat had gotten within a foot of him, and it cost him most of the hairs on his right arm. He didn't want to know what would happen if he actually allowed one to touch him. Instant mummification from extreme dehydration did not sound fun. Thus, Dami was forced to avoid it with the same fervor he would have. Both puppets were really being put through their paces, with the storm and scorch hearts corralling them around the room until they could be dealt with by either Kakazu's wind or lava hearts. All the while, the man himself stood idly, never having moved from where he began, arms crossed over his chest and wearing a confident smirk. And that was exactly how Naruto wanted him to feel. The lances of laser-focused electricity stayed right on Inari's heels, leaving the stone of the walls glowing red with their passing. In a sudden burst of speed, the puppet leapt off the wall, aiming for a precariously small patch of still unmelted ground. The lava heart immediately moved in to capitalize by removing that single stretch of sanctuary. However, at that moment Naruto forced Dami to stumble slightly, putting him off balance as he flailed over a thickly flowing stretch of magma. It caught Kakazu's full attention as he spotted the chance to get rid of the puppeteer and cut out the middleman entirely. The scorch and wind hearts converged, trapping, Naruto, with nowhere else to go. Distracted, he barely noticed as Inari's graceful arc was thrown to the side slightly by a sudden blast of diffuse sand from one of her tails. It nudged her over the lumbering form of the lava heart. Before Kakazu could realize his mistake, the air was filled with the crackle of his Storm Heart's laser circus shearing a clean hole directly through the porcelain mask that protected his lava heart. There was a strange squelching noise as the behemoth of writhing black cords abruptly unraveled, most of it falling limply into the surrounding lava. His anger at the loss was only compounded when Dami was destroyed, revealing the duplicity. I wonder, Naruto called out, making his voice echo in a disorienting manner, how many hearts until my 45 million's not worth it anymore. He punctuated the taunt by forcing Inari into a blind rush at Kakazu, a raising and swirling to life in her palm. Having lost his otherwise most damaging heart, Kakazu directed the wind and scorch hearts into her path. 
Similar to his old wind and fire heart, the two of them together could create some devastating combinations. Meanwhile, the storm heart began blindly firing arcs of deadly light up into the ceiling to try and catch the real puppeteer out. It matters little, Orokimaru can always provide other hearts, he will reward me most generously for delivering your body. The man's oddly colored eyes narrowed as Anari's target shifted to the wind heart now in her path. Although I think I shall keep your heart for my own. Not to use, but so I can have the pleasure of crushing it in my palm. Anari leapt forward with extreme speed, arm raised out in front of her. Both of the Jiongu puppets in front of her appeared to be breathing in, prepared to fill the room with an unbearably hot firestorm that was sure to destroy the puppet and smoke Naruto out, if the blind firing storm heart didn't get him first. Except, Naruto wasn't hiding in the ceiling anymore. Knowing this was going to suck, he dropped down from his vantage directly above the Scorch Heart, disguised by a particularly violent discharge from the Storm Mask. He landed on the strange creature's back, putting his full body weight behind the blow and suddenly forcing the porcelain face down and into one of the many streams of lava still flowing across the ground. Porcelain, even reinforced by Chakra, was no match for Molten Rock, and the heart inside went up in a hiss of foul-smelling smoke. Just in time for the Wind Heart to discharge its technique. No longer bolstered by the Scorch Heart, it wasn't an instantly lethal jutsu, but the power of it still threw Naruto clean across the room, skin now liberally dusted with shallow scratches. Anari was similarly thrown backwards, although with less damage, but in midair managed to angle her tail and spray out a powerful stream of water where Naruto would land. Instead of instantly catching a light the moment he touched down, he instead just landed on some very hot rock, suffering what would probably be a nasty burn on his right arm as he rolled back to his feet and dashed over to the relative security of the wall. Kakazu let his displeasure be known with a rumbling growl, the only outward sign of his frustration aside from the tensing of his arms. That was two hearts he had lost already, to some 18-year-old brat with a couple of dolls. It didn't matter to him that this was the same teen who killed Sasori, and had only improved since, because he should have been able to kill the macabre soon and in too. They were all just children to him, upstarts that didn't realize how outclassed they were. This time however, it was the puppeteer himself being chased down by his storm heart, the fastest of his constructs, and Naruto wasn't nearly as fast as Anari was. Focused as he was on finally eliminating the pest, he barely noticed as Anari jinked around the wind mask, a raising gun once again swirling into her palm. He sent the mask after her, firing nearly invisible bullets of air in rapid succession, but he knew it wouldn't catch up. As much as it galled him, Naruto's puppet was faster than his own Jiongu constructs. Instead, he simply allowed his defense to envelop his body, skin turning a shimmering gray. The little spiraling ball of energy slammed into his stomach and ground uselessly against the diamond-hard defense of his coton, Munkakaku Modo. She was forced to divert away as the wind mask caught up with her, having only succeeded in grinding a shallow spiral into his stomach that faded along with his steel release. It became obvious though, that the entire attack was a diversion, or at least, Naruto altered his plans on the fly when he realized even the Raisingan wasn't breaching Kakazu's defense. The Takinin had been distracted momentarily by the attack on his person, and when he next looked up at the fleeing puppeteer he only saw another copy of Dami being torn to shreds by a line of bright white lances of energy. The two-fold distraction made Kakazu realize too late that Inari had never relinquished her Raisingan, instead pivoting on one of her clawed feet and pouncing straight back at the wind mask on her tail. Her free hand came up in a tiger seal at her open mouth, and from his new hiding place Naruto smirked. Katen, Hosenka no Jutsu. Inari spat out a single, small ball of fire that swelled momentarily as it met with one of the pursuing mask's wind bullets, but otherwise neutralized it before it could reach her. She dived right through the small conflagration, carving it apart with the raising gun before slamming the technique straight into the mask with impunity. There was only a moment of resistance before it shattered the reinforced porcelain and pulverized the heart it concealed. As if to further insult Kakazu, she proceeded to use the unraveling Jiongu construct as a stepping stone to avoid the still molten floor, landing with cat-like grace on the wall and turning back to look at him with a coy smirk. She had only suffered a few light chars across her arms for the effort. Kakazu's eyes were now narrowed in murderous rage. Even during the invasion, he hadn't felt this humiliated. At least then it was a bunch of brats working in concert to whittle down his hearts. This was just one kid, who was taunting him no less. 
he was forced to uncross his arms to disguise the fact his hands had clenched into white-knuckled fists, that only tightened as Naruto's voice once again echoed around the arena. If we divide my bounty between your hearts, how much is that I've cost you now? 27 million by my count. His tone took on a dark edge as he continued. I wouldn't worry too much though, the cost is going to be a lot higher by the time I'm through with you. I don't know if you had a hand in kidnapping my apprentice or not, but right now, I really couldn't care less. Five puffs of smoke filled the room as a quintet of hane puppets were added to the fray. Glittering in the soft light cast by the still glowing lava below, they immediately dived down on the last remaining Jiongu puppet. In a flurry of wood and metal they darted in and out, never quite staying still long enough for even the prodigiously fast Rantan techniques to connect. The room was turned into a Van der Graaff generator as numerous lances of crackling light were thrown out in every direction, carving glowing lines into whatever surface they struck. Similarly though, despite how much they clawed and scratched, the Hain copies couldn't seem to do any lasting damage to the writhing black mask. The Jiongu parted around their wicked talons, merely a bundle of living wires that couldn't be hurt. Likewise, they couldn't muster the force to actually damage the reinforced porcelain protecting the controlling heart without being rendered into smoking wood and splinters by the counter. Except, they weren't trying to, because Naruto never fought so direct. Like a murder of crows taking to the sky after an explosion, the winged puppets all flew back from the storm heart as one. They fired off their lethally sharp feathers almost at random with each elegant twist of their body or powerful flap of their wings, filling the air with bright, glittering shrapnel that scattered the dimming light of the molten rock all around the room. It was through this hail of razor-sharp blades that Kakazu realized he had allowed his Jiongu construct to be drawn nearly to the other side of the expansive room. In that moment the soft glow of the lava was replaced by a harsher blue light and an ear-rending screech. Anari crouched in the middle of the room, on a small island of rapidly cooled rock that still cracked and popped under her clawed hands and feet. Over her arched back, eight of her tails cupped the air like a furry bowl, each tip pointed inwards toward a central point. It was there that the horrendous noise originated, as an enormous raisingan, larger than the puppet herself, slowly grew into being. It balanced on the tip of her ninth tail, the rotation and containment handled in equal measures by the other eight in alternating succession. This technique always took Naruto a minute to build, as handling the delicate balance of the Raisingen was hard enough, never mind at this scale. Approaching this size, the spiraling sphere of energy had its own weight, and the already brittle rock at Inari's feet buckled inwards under its pressure. Then, without further ceremony, the puppet dashed forward. The tail holding the enormous Raisingen stretched up and over her shoulder, placing the technique back in her hand where she held it out in front of her like the world's brightest battering ram. Kakazu desperately tried to recall his storm mask, firing off Rantan techniques in an attempt to disrupt the jutsu, but a flurry of Hain clones sacrificed themselves to block every shot with their bodies. So an Okibo Raisingen, Naruto muttered, voice drowned out by the wind his technique kicked up. Kakazu's body gained a metallic sheen a second before the Raisingen hit, and the world was knocked slightly off balance for a moment. Once again, the screech of rending metal filled the air, just audible above the already deafening roar of the Raisingen, then it destabilized, and Anari was launched back by the backlash. She managed to land in a graceful crouch, only to stumble and fall limply to the side a moment later. Using the massive Raisingen required he connect all of the tail's chakra networks at once, which overloaded the puppet, leaving her useless afterwards. It was supposed to be a finishing move, and it was a hell of one. As Naruto dropped back to the ground, careful to pick a spot where the cooling rock wouldn't ignite his sandaled feet, he could see Kakazu's defensive technique hadn't stood a chance. The man's torso had been blown open, revealing a mess of limp black threads, more akin to what a doll might be stuffed with, than a human. A few were dyed red, from the pulverized heart that even up to the last moments, Kakazu was assured would be protected. The blonde picked his way over the warped floor, now only glowing a dim red in places, until he stood over the man, looking down coldly. I'd like to say this was personal, but you just got in the way. His left arm abruptly lashed out, catching the porcelain mask of the storm heart between the grey fingers of his prosthetic as it tried to whip around him to reach Kakazu's body. I also know about your little revival gimmick. A whir sounded from his fake arm and the hand closed, crushing the reinforced porcelain like glass. Blood splattered from between his fingers and the rest of the black mass slumped, reduced to inanimate threads again. And I'm not impressed. 
he didn't give the corpse a second glance as he stepped over the man, stooping down to reseal Inari back into her scroll and stepped back out of the hole in the wall his body had made. He hoped he hadn't taken too long dealing with Kakazu. At least that marked two more profiles he could cross off his wall. Luckily, the fight outside didn't seem to be over just yet, and it hadn't moved anywhere else the way a lot of high-powered shinobi fights tended to do. As it was, it looked as though this particular conflict was winding down, and that didn't agree with Naruto at all, because Orokimaru's head was still attached to his neck. The Anbu they had brought with them lay scattered around the amphitheatrical room, either unconscious, dead, or soon to be one or the other. Naruto paid them little heed, having eyes only for the other side of the room. Orokimaru held Anko up by her neck, slowly rotating eyes staring down at where Jiraiya stood impotently, unable to make a move. Nobody was under any illusions that Orokimaru couldn't snap Anko's neck as surely as he could an errant twig. The only thing stopping him was, the moment he did, Jiraiya would be free to move. The kunoiki still struggled, but a lack of oxygen was making her movements sluggish and weak. Our Naruto, so kind of you to join us at last, the snake Sanon drawled, red eyes flickering over to the blonde's form as he moved across the room. That is you, isn't it? Naruto ignored him for the most part, instead drifting over to the sunken platform in the center of the room where Hanabi still lay on an operating table, apparently untouched by the conflict raging in the last few minutes. A quick check revealed an active pulse, but all the same he found his features twisting into a snarl as he noted the trail of blood leaking from the corner of her eye. The eye in question was gone, not even floating in a nearby jar the way Hidden's organs had. Either Orokimaru still had it, or he had destroyed it just to spite him. He wouldn't put either past the bastard. Just, kill him, already, Anko gasped, trying to lash out with her shin guard covered legs. They might as well have been kicks from a toddler for all Orokimaru paid him any heed. Ah, you overestimate my former teammate Anko-chan. You see, he suffers from a rather terminal case of sentimentality. As long as he even deems there's a slight chance of saving his comrade, he won't make so much as a move toward me. Spinning red eyes narrowed in mirth as a humorless grin spread his pale features. No, not even after orchestrating our sensei's death. Not after all the sickening, morally reprehensible, dare I say evil things I've done, he won't move so much as a muscle, the naive idealist he is. His sharingan flickered to the side. Our resident puppeteer on the other hand. Jiraiya's eyes widened, his hair suddenly flying out to the side and hardening into an impenetrable barrier just in time to catch a hail of lethally fast senban on a direct course for Orokimaru's neck. They skittered harmlessly off his needle jizo, and when the spiky wall of hair finally retreated back towards its owner, Orokimaru had already vanished. He left a gasping Anko kneeling on the ground in his wake, clutching at her throat and glaring daggers at Jiraiya. The moment she could speak without coughing, she staggered back to her feet and intensified her glare. Why did you stop him? He would have killed you. The Sanon replied, not looking too happy about the whole affair himself. You think I care? You think I wouldn't gladly give my life if it meant knowing that sick bastard was in the ground? She sneered, poking him knee in the chest. Orokimaru was right about one thing, you can't do it. She huffed, going back to rubbing her sore neck and waving absently at Naruto. At least Blondie had the balls to try something, even if it probably would have ended up with my snapped neck and Orokimaru shedding another of his damned skins. Aforementioned, Blondie, had long since stopped listening when he realized Orokimaru had gotten away. No doubt he was intelligent enough to work out how they had managed to track them from Anko's presence, and would take measures to prevent it happening again. The kunoiki was right, they had just blown the best shot at pinning the slippery Sanon down in one place, and Jiraiya hadn't the conviction to go through with it. Putting that aside for now, Naruto moved back towards the center of the room. He had an apprentice to see too. Okay, now with the other eye closed, Shizun said, drawing her finger back and forth in front of Hanabi's face. She observed how the new eye tracked her movements, keeping up just as well as a natural one. And now open this time an arcing motion to make sure it was in sync with her natural eye, but there didn't seem to be any problems there. And there's no blurriness, or delay at all. A lot of inexperienced eye transplants could result in disparate vision syndrome, which could have catastrophic effects on a shinobi's balance if left uncorrected. Hanabi merely shook her head, practically squirming in place. Shizun couldn't blame her, and with a quick glance over to Naruto, who merely shrugged, she sighed. Okay then, 
Only one thing left to test then. Go ahead. She stepped back, watching the young Huga as she took a deep, calming breath before forming a ram seal. Ayakugan. The girl very nearly cried as the world shifted into that familiar monochromic spectrum, her awareness expanding to encompass nearly a mile in every direction. It works. It actually works. Are you sure? Naruto asked, hopping down off the nearby counter and walking over to lay hand on her shoulder. At her sensei's voice, she frowned slightly, eyes narrowing in concentration. I. It's not perfect. There's a bit of blurriness when I try to focus on something distant, and when I try to zoom in on something I think I lose the depth, but it works. Your eye works, sensei. The blonde sighed in relief, having been anxious about this for the last two weeks of therapy and rehabilitation. This was the first of his artificial Byakugan to be tested, and it couldn't have come from a more willing subject. Hanabi had been devastated when she found out what had been stolen from her, and Naruto had been worried that she might slip into the white depression like so many of her family before her. He had thrown himself into his research with a fervor he hadn't felt since he decided to orchestrate a war all those years ago. Everything else became irrelevant except for perfecting a working version of his prosthetic Byakugan. It helped that he had a concrete motivation to succeed, and after three weeks of doing damn near little else except for eating and sleeping, and not all the much of either, if he was honest with himself, he finally had something he felt comfortable giving to Hanabi. Sounds like it might be a fluid imbalance. We'll go out and give it a proper test, then I can work on refining it. He smiled, rubbing her shoulder in what he hoped was a comforting gesture. Soon, you won't even be able to tell the difference. Already, the eye looked nearly identical to its organic counterpart. He had matched the slight shading of lilac she had instead of an iris, and it was the perfect size. The only tell, was the same thing he had noticed in Sasori. The eye was just a little too glassy, shiny, without being wet. He wasn't sure what he could do about that, but he was damn well going to try. He might have failed at producing a convincing replica of his arm but nothing would stop him from trying to give back what Hanabi lost when he failed in his duty as a sensei. His eyes widened a little as the girl reached over and delicately wrapped her arms around his waist. Thank you, Naruto. He chuckled after a moment, running a hand through his hair. In a way, you should really thank Sasori. Without his body as a basis, it would have taken Naruto years to have even an early model for a working optical prosthetic. Well, more years anyway. Posthumously, Sasori had catapulted his knowledge years forward in artificial biology. The man had decades to tweak and perfect his not-so-immortal shell. But Sasori didn't give me my eye back. Well, he couldn't contest that. It truly is a remarkable achievement, Shizun chimed in with a soft smile of her own. It was almost exactly like transplanting a normal eye. Those chakra wires of yours are quite incredible. If Lady Sunad were here. The woman trailed off, looking down with a sigh. The argument between her and her mentor when the latter decided to leave following the Sandime's death was supposed to be legendary. Naruto had missed it in his insomnia over the news of Hanabi's abduction, but had heard good accounts from the nurses that had witnessed it. Apparently, those that knew the normally meek and quiet woman barely recognized her as she stood her ground in front of the legendary medic. Naruto honestly wasn't sad to see the woman go, and he counted himself lucky that Shizune had stayed. After decades under Sunid's tutelage, between dealing with the woman's less than personable traits, she was undoubtedly the best medic Kanoa now had. He would have trusted nobody else to oversee Hanabi's treatment. She would probably be in a bar somewhere, unconscious or working towards it, Naruto muttered with a roll of his eyes. And you would still be here, doing the actual work. The woman blushed slightly under the praise. The quiet, whispering voice in the back of Naruto's mind told him she would have been exceptionally easy to manipulate, starved for genuine positive interaction as she was. He ignored it and simply favored her with a smile. In truth, Shizune had made this transition a great deal easier. Far from her mentor, she had an excellent bedside manner and was a genuinely personable medic. Gotta agree with Sensei there, Hanabi chimed in. I can't imagine anybody else doing this, Shizune. It helped that Hanabi and Shizune seemed to have struck up something of a friendship in their time together. Wasn't like they had much else to do with all those hours of therapy. I if you don't mind then, she stammered, unused to so much praise at once, I'd like to keep you for a little longer, just to make sure the Byakugan doesn't affect your normal vision at all. And on that note, Naruto said, saluting casually, I'll leave you to it. 
I'll have another look over the design tonight and see if I can't figure out why things are a bit blurry. See you for practice tomorrow then. Hanabi called after him, their heated argument before all of this went down all but forgotten. He was beginning to worry she had become a bit too attached as of late, but could let it slide for now, after everything she had been through. Sure thing. He backed out of the small hospital suite with an indolent wave, only to bump into somebody just as the door closed. You know, usually it's me grinding on the guy's lap, but if that's what you're into. A familiar and unwelcome voice purred over his shoulder. The blonde sighed, debating turning around at all. Hello Anko, what a wonderful surprise, he droned in perfect deadpan, earning what had to be an incredibly well-practiced pout. If it was on anybody else's lips, he might have believed it. Not happy to see me blondie. Not many guys can say the same, you know. He just rolled his eyes. I'm sure, he muttered, turning to walk down the brightly lit corridor with Anko easily falling into step beside him. You do realize that flaunting your promiscuity so regularly makes the facade come off as quite insincere. You'd do well to mix in some moderation if you wanted people to actually believe you get around as much as you imply you do. The kunoiki simply broke into a crocodile grin beside him. I have no idea what you're talking about, but you sure do have a way of making your gibberish sound smart, huh? What do you want Anko? Ooh. Are you that direct with all your women, because a lady could get used to that? I'm sure a lady could, yet here you are. Ouch. Fine, I'll get right to the point. I want you to help me go after Orokimaru. When he simply raised an eyebrow, she very nearly stumbled over her words to explain. Your little apprentice is all healed up, or so I hear, so you've got the time to help now, right? Time enough for a little excursion to settle some overdue business. You were there when Jiraiya explained we should take this slow right, and when he explained that Orokimaru had figured out how we tracked him and took steps to prevent that. Yeah yeah, Anko waved her hand airily. Something about using all the people he'd given curse marks to throw off any form of tracking. And the implicit instructions from our interim hockage. How hilarious had it been when Jiraiya was forced to take up that mantle, no matter how temporary he insisted the position was. Anko's lips merely twisted in displeasure. You saw the same thing I did. He may be a legendary Sanon, but he doesn't have the grit to go through with it if worst comes to worst. Her eyes narrowed, and for a second the, happy go lucky but I'll still kill you, Anko slipped away. And with Orokimaru, it always does. Then it was back like nothing had happened and she grinned at him, looping an arm over his shoulder and pressing herself against him. Not like you and I. He didn't argue that, having thought something similar himself over the last few weeks doesn't change the fact that we can't track him. Anko's lip twitched to that. Don't I know it? It's all I've been trying to do for the last month, and nothing. She turned that conspiratorial smile on him again. But you can't honestly stand there and say that you haven't thought about some way to get around it, right? I know your type. You have a challenge like that dropped in your lap and you just can't help figuring it out. Naruto didn't argue that either, because it was true. Once his initial drive to complete his implant by Akugan produced results, he had taken another look over the modified seal Jiraiya had come up with to track Orokimaru. It wasn't like he had put concerted effort into it, content mostly to care for his recovering student and let Jiraiya deal with it when it came to a head. Still, he had certain ideas of how to get around the issue. When he said nothing, Anko's grin turned predatory. I knew it. So, what is it, Brainiac? Some sort of super tracking seal. Hardly, just a simple alteration to yours. Orokimaru's hiding behind the other curse seal uses, and all of them bear that same, imprint, that we could use to track him. I could tweak things so that your seal would lead us to the nearest curse seal user, or failing that, Orokimaru. At that, Anko slid off him, opening her arms out wide with a grin. Sounds perfect to me. We go out, track down whoever's closest, kill Orokimaru if we find him and, if not, who's going to miss one of his lieutenants? We'd be doing the world a favor cleaning that scum from the continent. You say that like you've convinced me, the blonde drawled, although he couldn't deny he was intrigued by the prospect. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that at all, blondie. I think you'll find I can be very persuasive. Kanoa at night was a very different place. Without the steady bustle of foot traffic and the distant calls of stall merchants hawking their wares it could almost be described as eerie. The streets were hardly deserted though, with the late night crowd emerging to do their own business and the stumbling silhouettes of their patrons bathed in low red light. 
Atop the rooftops however, one could almost imagine the village was almost completely empty, only populated by the occasional flitting shadow of a shinobi either coming back after a long mission or heading out for a late assignment. That was Naruto tonight, hopping over the gaps in the street with a surety bred from a decade of practice. He didn't even have to disguise himself. Far from nearly every other town or village in the world, mysterious shadows flitting across the skyline was expected here, not suspicious. As he made his way over the ninja's highway towards the village gate, he was just another shinobi going about his business. And in a way, he was. The fact that his business was unsanctioned wasn't the point. There was still no hockage, thanks to the unprecedented lack of chosen successor. Still, the Sandime was nothing if not prudent, he had left provisions for this outcome. The Daimyo was supposed to come and confer with the top advisors in the village, and between them they would figure out who was best suited to the position. Although, it could all have been rendered moot if Jiraiya stopped playing at the stubborn child and just accepted the role. Nobody would dispute his claim to it, being the student of a hockage. He was certainly powerful enough, if not outright the most powerful shinobi still loyal to the village. He would likely have the temperament for it, if he could keep some of his less savory habits to himself. And, as a master of an extensive spy network, he was hardly a stranger to the bureaucratic side of running a large organization which, in essence, was exactly what Kanoa was. The only problem then was, he didn't want to be Hockage, much preferring to gallivant around the continent writing his smut. Now that the Hockage had passed, there was only one other person who could force Jiraiya of the Sanin to do anything he didn't want. Kami knew she wasn't going to be any help. So, right now, the only thing keeping him in that seat was the fact that the Daimyo had yet to grace the village with his presence, sending courier after courier with his deepest, most sympathetic apologies that he was much too busy. It was a well-known fact that the Daimyo was one of the few people able to make the Hockage do anything at all. It was a no less well-known fact, although less spoken about, that in reality, the Daimyo had very little power over their respective hidden villages. They weren't a figure to be pissed off, certainly, but that bridge ran both ways. The leader of their nation brushing off a summons to the hidden village like this for so long was, unusual. So, Jiraiya remained interim, and the mission office remained a murky, easily manipulated mess. By the time he and Anko got back from their unauthorized jaunt, nobody should have been the wiser to it. You're bringing the kid, Anko asked as he dropped down to street level next to her, a few houses down from the gates. Who are you calling a kid? Hanabi shot back. Oh ho, the older Kunoiki replied, that dangerous spark of mirth dancing in her eyes, she thinks she has spunk. Well, we'll see about that. When she glanced back at Naruto, ignoring Hanabi's silent fuming, he shrugged. Five weeks out, she needs to get back into practice and get some experience with the new eye. Plus, he didn't want her out of his sight for the foreseeable future unless what he was seeing was more dangerous than leaving her alone again. Practice. Anko scoffed. Against Orokimaru. That's make you nearly as crazy a teacher as he was. We're not facing Orokimaru today. He'd either be insane or stupid to stay so close to the village if he knows how we're tracking him. The best we can hope for is a lieutenant, or one of those reject monstrosities he's so fond of. Maybe we can get his location out of one of them, but it's not going to be any time soon. Anko didn't bother arguing, simply sniffing sharply in distaste. Well, I knew it wasn't going to be quick, if that's what you meant. I have nothing but patience. And then, as if just to be contrary, she bounced eagerly on her feet. Shall we then? They had made it a good distance north before Naruto even allowed Anko to activate the altered tracking Shiki. Outwardly, it was because it would be pointless anyway so close to the village. In reality, it was because he was well aware that Sasuke still held a curse seal, and there was no point letting Anko know that. Nobody else knew after all, and Naruto would prefer to keep it that way. Thankfully, when they finally did turn it on, it led Anko away from the village, instead of toward it, so he knew they were on the right track. All three were surprised however, when Anko insisted that the seal was pulling her towards the capital, of all places. Well this can't be anything good, Naruto muttered as the three of them stood before the enormous ornate gate that marked one of the four entrances to Hyan Edo, the capital of Fire Country. This was the Hagen Morn, the steel gate of the south, named for the highway that almost directly linked it to Kanoa itself. Distinct from the Hyoi Morn to the north, only accessible to nobles and the royal family, the Kinmorn to the east, primarily used by merchants and the largest trade route on the continent, 
and the Ishimorn to the east, the original entrance back when Hyan Edo had been a simple trading outpost. What would a lieutenant of Orokimaru want in the capital? Hanabi asked as they were waved past by a bored-looking samurai. He reminded the young Huga of the Chunin stuck on gate guard duty back home, only their boredom was feigned, most of the time. Nothing good, Anko muttered under her breath as the trio began weaving through the thick crowds bustling about the city's busy streets. It wasn't hard, the moment people caught sight of their headbands they were all too quick to move out of their way. Even in Hai no Kuni, people didn't like to risk getting in the way of Shinobi. If they had come in from the west, it would have been a straight shot down Hain's main road, the legendary Kindoro where it was said you could buy anything if you looked hard enough, to the palace at the city's heart. As it was, it took some weaving through bustling streets, just beginning to stir with the morning's activity, before the Barakudan came into view. Like a monument to the continent's most wealthy nation, the Rose Palace stood above the surrounding buildings like a pale pink beacon of opulence. Once a fanciful extension to the original fortress atop the hill, it had quickly overtaken the old fortifications until nothing remained but a home fit for a daimyo. In any other place it would have been a gaudy monstrosity, but framed by the red-tiled roofs of the sprawling city below, it stood out like a jewel in a particularly ornate crown. Thanks to the pale pink quartz it was constructed from, all of it imported at great expense, when the light of the sun struck it just right, namely, at sunrise and sunset, it bathed the entire city in a warm glow, like a reminder of the daimyo's watchful gaze. The numerous ranks of samurai at the palace's gates only helped to reinforce the image. Thankfully, their forehead protectors were better than a signed invitation, and the trio was waved past just as easily as at the gates. Despite the apparent oversight in security, Naruto knew that the moment they were spotted a message had been sent to those that needed to know. Fully aware of this, he paused in the impressive courtyard that, even at this early hour, was a flurry of activity. Beside him, Anko was practically wilting in pain, gripping her cursed seal with a shaking hand. Figuring that was as accurate as they were going to get, he obligingly reached over and deactivated the tracking seal, letting the kunoiki slump in relief. Hanabi was looking around behind him. She had been to the capital before, but never to the Barakudan itself. Hyashi had lost much of his interest in external politics after his wife's passing. Although Naruto considered that wisdom, as opposed to indifference, considering what he knew of court drama. I'm guessing that if Orokimaru's agent being in the capital was bad, that them being here is even worse. She guessed in a hushed voice. Nail on the head, he muttered back, disguising his own concern. There were only two types of people with cursed seals, those that survived, and those that wished they hadn't. If one of the rejects was here, they would know it. Those mindless brutes had no sense of subtlety whatsoever. They were only good as fodder, a little stronger than an average genin, only less intelligent and harder to kill. Those that survived the procedure on the other hand, were the type who easily became strong enough to rise to prominence in Orokimaru's eyes. Not exactly the kind of people you would waste as a simple spy, which meant their presence here was of a more malicious nature. His musing on the subject was cut short when Anko stood up straight, disguising her previous discomfort just in time for their hosts to arrive. Three of them, flickering in like ninja, but all marked with the distinctive grey sash of the Twelve Guardians. They were the reason Naruto hated taking jobs in the capital. They took their positions extremely seriously, and any slight insinuation that they weren't enough for the daimyo's needs was taken as a grave insult. Asuma was a lot better off for having left them, that was for sure. The whole situation wasn't exactly helped by the fact they small group was still recovering from an attempted coup from within a few years ago. Morning, friends from the south, an affable young man with the shaved head and robes of a fire temple monk greeted them. The current leader of the guardians. What can the twelve do for you today? Mikaku, Naruto returned with a small inclination of his head. He had found it paid to be respectful here, as the Twelve had de facto control over the daimyo's security and could immediately gum up any kind of investigation they attempted. Our Naruto, I was wondering when we would see your face again, the man said with a knowing smile. No need to ask why you're here, of course. Although, it's a bit early isn't it? The blonde purposefully ignored the questioning look he got from Hanabi. Your companions on the other hand, I'm afraid I haven't had the pleasure. Hugo Hanabi, my apprentice, he introduced, as if Mikaku didn't know. He was the type to always remain informed of these things, and the pale eyes and gilded cage seal were a dead giveaway. And Mitarashi Anko, a friend. 
the kanaki in question took the opportunity to loop an arm around his neck, pulling him towards her a little too forcefully. The bestest, she agreed with a shark's grin. Ah, Mikiko acknowledged with a strange smile. We've never met Mitarashi-san, but your reputation certainly does precede you. I get that a lot. Well, I am Shirohara Mikiku, formerly of the Fire Temple, and my two associates are Gekko Hanryo, he gestured to the absolute bear of a man standing behind him, with a thick but finely kempt black beard and an enormous Zanbato strap to his back, and Kitaman Tayuya. His hand drifted to the woman to Hanryo's right. She was a few years Naruto senior by the look of things, with long rose red hair and wearing an elegant, if risque kimono top that suggested she wore little beneath. A pleasure, Naruto drawled. If the formalities are all accounted for. Of course, Mikaku said, still wearing that mysterious smile. I wouldn't want to keep you. Usual restrictions apply of course. Restrictions. Anko cut in, still irritatingly hanging off Naruto's shoulder. No entering the throne room, no visiting any personal rooms, and no interaction with any of the royal family without invitation, Naruto explained dryly, shrugging her off him before turning back to Mikaku. Did I get that right? Perfectly, the former monk said, gesturing to his two companions. Will you be needing a guide at all? We should be fine. Good, Hanryo grunted. He seemed like a friendly enough man, but it was quite obvious that mornings didn't agree with him. We're not babysitters. Well, Mikaku carried on as if he hadn't heard the small snipe, I'm sure you'll be able to find me if you need anything. Enjoy your stay at the Rose Palace. Not for too long I hope, Tayuya muttered off to his side. Naruto repaid the courtesy by ignoring the comment and simply nodded at the man, leading Hanabi, and to a lesser extent Anko, past the other trio. As they passed by, Anko glanced down at Tayuya's feet, clad in unusual grey sandals that wound up her lower leg in criss-crossing straps. Nice shoes. The redhead merely smirked. Designed for comfort when I lodge them up someone's ass, and they breath like a dream. Anko matched her smile tenfold all the way up to when she was forced to look away to keep pace with the others, jogging to catch up. I like her. Mission first, playtime after, Naruto shot back lazily, nodding to a samurai he recognized as they passed between the huge ornate doors of the inner palace. Who says they have to be separate? She drawled back, licking her teeth and glancing back over her shoulder, but the three guardians had already vanished. Don't antagonize the guardians, they can make our job here a lot harder without much effort. We need to keep all of this quick, quiet and out of sight. It would be bad it if got out that an agent of Orokimaru came so close to the Daimyo. Anko huffed, but acquiesced all the same. All right then, should we split up? I have no idea how you operate, and you sure as hell don't know how I do things, so we'd probably just step on each other's toes. Sure, it wasn't a hard concession. He had been waiting for an excuse to get away from the older Kunoiki. Cool, then I'll nab your apprentice for a bit, scope the place out. You'll do what? Hanabi asked, blinking. Anything Anko might have replied in was abruptly put to the side as a voice cut across the open foyer. Naruto Sensei. A young girl called, maybe a year or two younger than Hanabi. She glided across the polished floor of the hall with what had to be extensively ingrained grace, barely ruffling the hems of her exquisite hanfu. Despite being just a child, the clothes looked like they belonged on an empress, leaving no doubts who this was. Naruto Sensei. Hanabi muttered under her breath, eyebrow quirked as she glanced at the teen in question. She found him looking up, eyes closed and lips drawn tight across his teeth as he took a deep breath in. Then his features reset, becoming blank and entirely indifferent. He looked around as though he hadn't even heard the girl speak, the only outward sign of his recognition being a slight roll of his eyes. Ayumi Haim, he greeted curtly. Far from what Hanabi would have expected, the girl merely giggled at his brusque demeanor. As blunt as ever Naruto sensei, but that's what I like about you, isn't it? She suddenly did a twirl, making her dress flutter out at the hems. What do you think? I had this one designed myself. Stunning, he said, as if commenting on particularly bland weather. Although it wasn't untrue. The girl wasn't only immaculately dressed, she looked as though an entire team of artists had sculpted every inch of her face. Despite her obvious youth, she was already beginning to come into her figure, and it promised to be the kind that set entire courts ablaze with gossip and suitors. Hanabi already inexplicably disliked her. I thought so, Ayumi said, either not hearing or outright ignoring his insincerity. Are you here for another lesson? 
I've been practicing, she smiled conspiratorially. On her aristocratic features, it looked as though she was sharing secrets that could destroy a country. I know you didn't tell me to, but really, what kind of student would I be if I couldn't read between the lines, as the common parlance goes? Not this time Ayumi Haim, I'm here for business. The girl just scoffed good-naturedly. Oh come now, that's what you said last time, and the time before that. Besides, I know every time father sends for a shinobi, and you aren't on that list. It can't be that important. She grabbed his hand and began to pull him away, or tried to at least. There's always time for a small lesson. Oh, I have so much to show you, I think you'll be really pleased with my progress, and then there's. Sensei, Hanabi finally asked, loud enough to cut off Ayumi's little spiel. It was enough to grab the other girl's attention, bringing her around with a small, dignified cough. Ah, I apologize, Ayumi said slowly, taking in the other two with a curious eye. In my excitement, I seem to have neglected to notice your companions. She seemed to pay special attention to Hanabi, gliding over to the other girl with an ethereal grace and sizing her up with an indecipherable look. A Huga, I presume. You are supposed to be a kind of ninja nobility. The edges of her lips quirked up amusedly. How quaint. And sensei, you say. That's just adorable. You know he was my teacher first. Ayumi Haim, Naruto said with a suffering tone, getting her to wave her hand airily. Not that it is a competition, or anything of the sort. I am merely pointing it out as her, senpai. She seemed to taste the word, luxuriating in it for a moment before finding it to her liking. Senpai, Hanabi asked, absolutely befuddled by this point, and only earning herself a pat on the cheek from the younger girl. Yes, Senpai, do keep up. Naruto has been teaching me puppeteering for years now, she glanced to the side as if reconsidering, before adding, on and off. Mostly off, the blonde drawled, giving Hanabi a look over Ayumi's shoulder that told her to just go along with it for now. No need to be coy, Sensei, Ayumi said as a well-dressed servant walked over, leaning down to whisper in her ear softly. Whatever the news was, it clearly wasn't anything the girl wanted to hear. Really. Now. She sighed, managing to make it look elegant as opposed to petulant, the kind of sigh that informed people valuable time was being wasted. It can't be helped I suppose. She turned back to Naruto, giving him a small bow that was perhaps a hair too deferential to be proper. It seems I am needed elsewhere, but don't be a stranger Naruto sensei. You know where to find me. And then she was off, gliding away with the servant in tow deeper into the palace. She walked with a confident gait that only a noble could have in a setting this absurdly opulent, and, like every noble Hanabi had the displeasure of meeting, she left only infuriation and irritation in her wake. The only caveat in her favor was that it seemed entirely unintentional, although Hanabi wasn't sure if that was better, or worse. Well, now that's out of the way, Naruto said, attempting to move right on only to be held in place by the combined curiosity, an implicit demand in Hanabi's case, of his companion's stares. Fine, if you must know. He pinched the bridge of his nose and let his eyes quickly glance around to make sure he wasn't overheard. After the Akatsuki incident it got out that I was involved heavily in the defeat of their leader. That kind of thing tends to draw the fleeting attention of the nobles, the Daimyo especially. He's the kind of man that enjoys throwing a party for whatever reason he can think of. I'm not of the mind to be throwing away easy connections, so I attended. I figured his interest in me would be as temporary as everything else. He sucked his teeth. Unfortunately, his daughter, who you have just made the acquaintance of, thought to make a big deal of it. She seemed to think that the leader of the Akatsuki couldn't be such a terrible threat if he was defeated by dolls, of all things. I didn't take particularly well to that, but I also knew that pissing off the nobility wasn't in my interests. I thought if I just ignored her, she would lose interest and go bother somebody else. Or, Anko cut in with a saccharine grin. See, now that's how I know you're a virgin blondie, because you don't get how women work at all, do you? Naruto's eyes narrowed, but he didn't refute her. It turned out that after a life of having her every whim catered to her, ignoring her only had the opposite outcome. If anything, she only became more interested in me. I thought I'd humor her a bit, show her a bit of mundane puppetry to sate her curiosity, but now she has some twisted idea that I'm her sensei. I thought you said you only ever had two missions in the capital, Hanabi accused. I wasn't lying. It's just that the second happens to be of an ongoing nature. 
It really was rather irritating too, as Ayumi was actually a very intelligent girl and would make a savvy leader. Which was good, because without another heir, she was slated to be the next Daimyo. And of course, Anko smiled again, giving him a Cheshire grin, the girl is clearly only interested in puppetry, and nothing else from the young, dashing war hero who isn't a toadying bootlicker like everybody else she has to deal with. Naruto just shot her a glare that seemed to bounce right off her. It's not exactly relevant to our current mission, is it? Except, even saying that, he knew it was untrue. If he wanted to get a feel for the palace and how things might have changed recently, Ayumi was probably his best bet. She wasn't just bright, she was perceptive too. She had spent her entire life soaking up the subtle nuances of court life, and if anybody could spot something out of place, it was her. Aha, uh -huh, sure thing, stud, the older Kunoiki said, already guiding Hanabi by the shoulder. We'll just leave you to your, puppetry, lesson. The blonde sighed, but didn't bother arguing, instead looking down at Hanabi. If you, he tapped the side of his head, near his eyes, make sure it's out of sight. People here know what it means, and won't appreciate it. To Anko, he merely glared at her. Don't antagonize the guardians. She acted wounded, hand over heart, as she led his apprentice away by the shoulder. Hanabi shot him one last look, seeming conflicted, before shrugging out of the older woman's grasp and falling into step beside her. Naruto rubbed his temples before heading off towards the servants' quarters. He still had a few veins to tap before he had to resort to anything, unpleasant. So, Anko started up as soon as they had passed out of sight of Naruto. First visit to the Rose Palace, huh? I remember mine. Could hardly stop myself stealing everything that wasn't nailed down. Shoving your wealth in people's faces like this should be criminal. Says the trained killer, Hanabi muttered absently, not really paying attention. Ouch. You are your master's apprentice, huh? Isn't that a little cynical for a fresh genin? Is it any less true? Anko just clicked her teeth with a grin. Didn't say that, she mused, treating Hanabi to a more intrigued look. The Hugo had experience with those types of expressions, and knew to cut off any line of questioning before it could begin. So, you've been here before. I thought Mikaku said you two hadn't met. Just because he's never seen me, doesn't mean I've never seen him, Anko offered mysteriously, only to shatter the mystique with a lopsided grin. But nah, I came here a way back, a little younger than you. Never got a taste for all this political by play the way your sensei did. You think he enjoys this? Naruto had only ever shown blatant distaste in the goings-on of the nobility, considering it trivial and irrelevant. You think he doesn't? Anko shot back. I saw the look in his eyes, and I know his type. Ninja like him, they love this stuff. He's a schemer, and the kind of secrets and intrigue that go on behind closed doors in places like this are like a fine wine. Naruto sensei doesn't drink. Anko's eyes gleamed. My point exactly. Everyone has a vice, and I'd much rather trust a pervert or an alcoholic than somebody who doesn't appear to have one. The two lapsed into silence at that, and Hanabi took the opportunity, away from any obvious means of being seen, to quickly tap into her Byakugan. With the prosthetic, her sight still wasn't perfect, but her natural eye seemed to make up for the shortcomings of its artificial counterpart, for the most part. Limited to the palace grounds like this, it was like nothing had changed. For a moment, she familiarized herself with the feel of Anko's curse mark, then cast her gaze out wider to try and find something like it. She had no luck before another court functionary came into view and she was forced to deactivate her sight. So, Anko began again. What do we think of our young Daimyo to be? What? Her? Hanabi sputtered, caught off guard by the sudden tangent. She seems just like every other noble I've met. Anko hummed noncommittedly. Because I'm sure you've met a ton. Enough, Hanabi argued. It certainly felt like it. In times of peace like this, it was more often than not nobles who needed the services of shinobi. I wouldn't be too sure. There's a fire under that veneer. The older woman mused. Hell, if she's anything at all like her mother, well, this country could use somebody like her after all the asinine decisions her father made over the years. Old man Sandai must have had a hell of a time keeping him from doing any permanent damage. Her mother, really. Hanabi thought of the rather, corpulent woman that came by Kanoa ever few weeks or so to reclaim her runaway cat, now deceased as she understood it. Madam Shijimi was her stepmother, Anko explained, preempting her thoughts. 
You should have seen Lady Amayuki. Now there was a woman with the full package. Brains and beauty. What happened to her? Died while our little princess was still young. There was a big hurrah about it at the time, a lot of finger pointing and foul play implied, but nothing proven. Supposedly, she was having a little extra marital tryst with one of the guardians. With what I've seen of the Daimyo. Couldn't blame her. Then again, that might have just been the court rumor mill at work. Can't trust a word that comes out of this place. Noted. But yeah, if Ayumi inherited even half of her mother's best traits, Haino Kuni will be in good hands. She glanced down at Hanabi slyly, nudging her slightly. Might not be the only thing she's inherited from her mother, given the way she was eyeing Blondie. You can't be serious, Hanabi grouched defensively. She's like, 11. She didn't like the way Anko was smiling at her. Weren't we all once? Wouldn't be the first to fall for the broken ninja, hoping to fix him up and bring out the warm, kind-hearted soul behind the stoic facade. Or, for all I know, she's just into older guys. She shrugged uncaringly. It's not like it matters, Hanabi said. Naruto-sensei isn't the kind of person who would pay her any attention like that. Oh ho, Anko chortled, flicking the younger Hugo under her chin. Is that a little spark of the ugly green beast I see? And I ain't talking about guy spandex clad behind. Hanabi merely turned away without dignifying her with a response. It had nothing to do with the light dusting of red on her cheeks. Listen kid, from me to you, I try and curb the girlish crush while you can. What would you know, about being infatuated with an older, more powerful shinobi that also happens to be my mentor? More than you know kid. The surprisingly honest admission was enough to knock Hanabi off balance. There was none of the usual playfulness on the kunoiki's features as she spoke. It was kind of unnerving. So, with Orokimaru, Anko glanced down at her with a sad smile. He's a monster, but the best monsters never look like one. Stop doing that, Hanabi growled suddenly, taking a step away from Anko. Stop comparing Naruto-sensei to Orokimaru. They're nothing alike. I'm sure they're not, Anko said, again in that non-committal tone. But trust me, when you said Blondie wouldn't be interested in a girl like Ayumi, you weren't wrong. But that's only because he ain't interested, period. Some people are just like that, and you gotta learn to recognize it before it crushes you. Hanabi sniffed dismissively. You act like you're some expert on people. You don't know Naruto at all. Nobody knew Naruto, not like she did. Not an expert, Anko sighed, running her fingers through her spiky, fanned out ponytail. Just somebody with experience. Whatever, Hanabi muttered, quickening her pace a bit. So, how were you planning on gathering information? If she had to be stuck in this woman's presence, she might as well learn something. Behind her, Anko shrugged, setting her smirk back on her features and skipped along to catch up. She had done her humanitarian bit for the day, now she could have some fun. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.